Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Tuesday, September 27th, 2022. It's great to be back with Professor Mike Gurness. Mike, once again, great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining me again. You're very welcome, David. It's great to be here this afternoon. Mike, what I want to do today is pick up in the area of 2008, 2009, when it became obvious that Jeroen Trump was going to move over to Princeton, first on the research side, what did this mean for you? Were you still intensively working with him at that point, or had the computer system more or less been set up and you were both on to different things at that point? Um, well, actually, it was really quite interesting. By the time, once Jeroen had set all of this up, um, it turned out that, I mean, with the development of his new software platform and his ability to do these computations of synthetic seismograms for all intents and purposes, what they were, and our simultaneous ability to do convection, um, it was kind of a really a it was kind of a hard slog at that point forward in Jeroen's research, and I think we all recognized that, even though he had made this big jump in in methodology um it turns out that the in order what the the next step to take his code was called full waveform tomography and he you know and i wanted him to do it for the deep you know we wanted him to do it for the deep earth and to do it for regional problems and we had different ideas about all of this but in reality it actually could only be done in a practical way for limited regions. So he he had a student, and I think this his name was Carl Tate, but I, I think you may have actually spoken with yeah. Carl. Yep. Carl actually, um, w I think he finished up after Jeroen had left, but I think it was Carl's research which demonstrated to all of us both how powerful the methodology was, but yet on the other hand, how intensely difficult it was to move forward and progress was going to be slow because in order to do the full inverse with the seismic to the 3D structure with this method uh, would, would be very slow. So I think, um, you know, I, I think it was disappointing to see Jeroen leave because uh, he, was, he was a great colleague, it was great to talk with him um, he also strongly believed in computational methodologies, which initially, you know, not everyone was fully behind, but uh, generally most people were, to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was it was mostly just, you know, sad. That was just the the, the course of course of things for personal reasons. Uh, Yeroen thought it was best that he move to the East Coast. Um, so you know, it was. It obviously was um, a disappointment for us. It it was. I mean, it was a lot of other people at the at the time. So I guess it it didn't feel as as harsh as it probably should have felt. Because um, um, I think we also had uh, uh, Pablo Ampuero on the faculty, and I'm trying to remember if we had yet hired Victor Sai yet. I'm not. Sure. Um, so anyways, it was a disappointment to see Jeroen leave. Um, and we obviously had planned out a lot of things. At, 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 uh, yeah, he liked to think big, which was great. And I know there's some variation in terms of the, the length of term for Seismo Lab directors, but I assume for Jeroen, it, it was pretty short in the, in the grand scheme of things. It was, um, it was kind of short. Yep. I mean, I think he would have remained a very nice director um he you know i think um when don helmberger was director it was about the same you know it, i think don's was five years i, I think uh Jeroen's may have been just slightly under that uh, i'm not which was then so caltech actually has a standard term these days uh for most administrative appointments their default appointment is five years and they they don't like really to continue to appoint people after two but actually yeah but they're doing that for me so um they're continuing to appoint me after 10 years so it was 
you know, we had this intermediate period. We had uh, Hiru became director with, uh, you know, especially at this time with the Trinet and Terrascope, which was really great. Um, and then and then Don took over, and that was a little bit difficult. I don't know if anyone has mentioned this to you, but um, Don's term was a. I mean, scientifically, it was wonderful within the lab. We, did, we discovered a lot of things. We wrote trillions of papers. But also, I think it was quite difficult for him because we were making this transition where Caltech Seismolab was a little bit on the forefront of our digitization and our computerization of uh, our operations, which you know just keep continuing. And so Don had to sort of have this transition between the um, between having sort of people who you know normally read the records and having the computers do a lot of the work and then the people checking on that, and then also the the funding spigot was a little bit low for a while and then it pre pre earthquake early warning and then it, and then there was a period of time and then of course earthquake whirling took off but that was under my term not not in not in anyone else's. So anyway, it was a little bit difficult there. So Don actually, he only kept it for five years. And then when he finished it up, um, then then Yeroon seemed like a natural pick to be director. Um, and then for reasons entirely unrelated to Caltech, Yeroon thought it was best for him to move to the East Coast. So yeah, it, it was a little bit on the short side. It would, it would have been really be nice uh, that if it was longer. As he put it to me, as a Dutchman, he just needed more rain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was he left for other, other reasons related, unrelated to science. So, um, yeah, but he was he's a great guy. Mike, what he did really, that mean for you? Did you recognize at the time that that you would get tapped next? Well, initially, I was not tapped next. I was not. Uh, I was so busy with other activities um, that Ken Farley did not appoint it. A regular director for a while, maybe a year or something. He's trying to figure out what to do, and then he asked me if I would be willing to do it. Uh, and of course, I wasn't really happy because I had was helping the National Science Foundation out in the geophysics community move forward uh, in software engineering at the national level, and we were going like gangbusters. And there was a lot of people to manage. Um, there's a lot of money to manage and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of politicking, uh, because it was a national thing, but because I had all this experience more than anyone else around, um, eventually I think Ken felt that he had no alternative, but to try to ask me. So at that point, I didn't know how things would work out. Um, because um, again, I had this role. The community was okay. We, you know, we 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 put in enough um, checks and balances within community oversight so that we could figure out a way to do it. It was also at a kind of a difficult time. Uh, you know, I had got the thing going and it was really really going well, and uh, we needed to write. We were already writing the proposal for the next for the next phase and the, the the committees had appointed a committee to write the proposal even though I would be the PI and then the there was an executive committee and they you know I we liaison with them and then they set up a procedure by which the community then would find a new director um in a not a democratic way but at least in a in in a way which was transparent um mike from your perspective the year without the the director for the seismo lab what did that mean what was lacking that you know ken clearly needed somebody to to run things at the seismo lab well eventually i mean a director is absolutely needed because especially these days um i mean there's a lot of there's budgets there's people to manage there's uh there's a lot of giant giant projects. Um, there's people. That, now we have two research professors, but we need people to be their supervisors. And then there's just a large staff. 
Um, but there was a, I mean, Rob Clayton was the acting director. Um, and uh, the division eventually decided that it needed a permanent director. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I know it's just 12 or 13 years ago, I forget exactly what had happened if I announced to the community that I would um, pull back uh, from the community efforts in geophysics, or if I first agreed to do this for Caltech. I, I, I forget exactly the detail, but uh, but no, and then for a while I, I had to to do to do both and uh, it was fine. I mean, actually, I, in hindsight, I probably could have now actually I know I could have done both, which is a terrible thing to say. <laughs> I'm not sure, if, but it wasn't good for me to do actually. And actually, it was very interesting. It turns out there was a kind of like a like a freedom that I also felt uh, on the community side of things because I within my own area of geodynamics, I wanted to steer things in a different directions for my research of going into inverse models and but the rest of the community did not want to do this right so there was not and i had started this collaborations with these mathematicians and these computer scientists who eventually we you know we our goal was eventually to do inverse models but we had to do this big step um uh in terms of uh scientific in terms of methodologies for doing the computations on parallel computers. And uh, there was a huge skepticism, massive skepticism amongst my colleagues of doing this. And so it was kind of good that I like freed myself from the community oversight of the geodynamics because the community didn't want to do what I wanted to do. And um, so it was a kind of a, a, like a freeing me up a bit, I think. Now, the proposal, what, what was the big ask at this point when you were thinking about these things at a national level? Well, we had already set this stuff up at the national level, right? We, had, we were already going by this time for five years, right? We had set it up and uh, we convinced the National Science Foundation that what geophysics needed was infrastructure for software and software engineering. And, uh, and with community oversight and best practices. And uh, I got that going, right? With Yarun and I, we, pa we, we figured it all out from our own research uh, five years before, more than five years before at that point. And we figured out the way really to move forward. And then I had spent the last five years implementing it on, for geophysics. And uh, through the grapevine, basically what we found out is that the National Science Foundation eventually created what we'll call software institutes. And they basically patterned it after our idea in geophysics. And uh, I mean, they don't publicly say this, but you can hear program officers occasionally mention this, but things get lost, you know, there's a lot of egos involved, so. But I had heard that, and so it kind of tickles us pink within geophysics that, that we, we played this role for the broader scientific community, even though it may not be widely appreciated outside. You know, and there's so much turnover of program officers at NSF, so. Um. Now, when you became director, what, what vantage point, what perspective did you come to appreciate about the Seismo Lab that you couldn't get as a civilian, so to speak? Well, that, I mean, I think it was my perspective of, well, I mean, I had two things, right? I had, um, I had my own experience in administration, which you know, which is now quite extensive by that point. And um, but then I had been, you know, I mostly grew up scientifically within the Seismo Lab, so I knew why it was special, why it was that interact that interdisciplinary interaction between people, and for me, it that's always been the most that's always been the singularly most important thing is to keep the Seismo Lab small and keep people interacting with one another. And that's it. And uh, the science is gonna keep moving forward. And I personally can't move the science forward myself. It's gotta come from the young, brilliant, young scientists with a new vision in terms of methodologies and technologies and ideas. And so it's always been that I leave things in the hands of the young people 
but I try to, we try to keep, and I'm always going to use the word we, me and the other senior faculty who believe in this strongly um, to keep this going. And that's, that's sort of it. I mean, I don't, I don't want to make the Sizemore Lab this gigantic soft money outfit. I mean, that's a typical way that a lot of things progress. Um, you know, you get spun off, you go, you know, you know, years ago, I mean, I'm sure the Sizemore Lab itself, if it wanted to, and there's been different things, we could have just like, like broke off, broke apart in the sense of doing stuff within on campus and then have these gigantic like centers, right? Sometimes those centers become so large, they become larger than Caltech. Sometimes they just become as large as a department. We see them in the neighborhood here. But, uh, but here, but there's all, but on campus, the things that really make it work are the things that are small and intimate, in my own opinion. Things that are much more back, harking back to what makes Caltech good, which is people interacting with one another. Um, whereas, the overall trend in science, including many things that Caltech spins off and spins off very successfully, is to make them gigantic and that ultimately under the government's largesse. Um, we saw, of course, oceanographic institutions are a great example of this. They, they became gigantic and they grew and they grew and they grew and they grew uh, until they reached a point where they couldn't grow anymore and then eventually then there's all this pain, right? When they can't grow anymore. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, my ambitions have never been really to make make this thing big. And and um, and I just want, like when I did the geophysics things for the community, I wanted it to be of a certain size and it got to that certain size. And, you know, I didn't want it to be my own or anything like that. And I just sent it off on its own way. So yeah, I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question, no, no, David, no. or not. But... On a personnel level, you know, between the keeping it small and keeping it interactive, what opportunities did you have for hiring at that point? Were there new faculty you were in a position, young faculty you were in a position to, to recruit? Well, I mean, we hired, I mean, the, the folks that had left, uh, like Victor Sai and, um, Pablo and Puero, they were recruited with Yarun. And then what I, and then with the division, I mean, I, you know, it's not my, you know, the, the geophysics faculty, you know, wanted to hire these, you know, sequentially these two folks after, after we identified them, which is Zhang Wen and, uh, and, and Zach. And, um, and I think that's the greatest thing that's happened since I've been here, right? Those hiring of those people, because they're the ones with the absolutely brilliant new ideas um, and are moving the whole scientific community forward. And uh, But they're moving it forward because they're at Caltech, and Caltech is a nice, great, interactive, well-supportive in environment and supportive environment. And so that's sort of my role, right? My role, in my opinion, is, is to do that. It's about the core faculty and the core faculty can't be too big. And we will really want to hire some more young assistant professors. And, you know, I have the faculty have various ideas. And, uh, but when it really comes down to it, it almost always is going to come down that we're just going to probably just hire the best people we can find, right? That's what's going to happen. We're just going to look around. And when we see another great person, we will hire them. Um, and uh, we're looking around. Coming in in 2009, right smack in the middle of the financial crisis, what did that mean for the Seismo Lab? Were there was there any belt tightening that needed to happen? Well, let's see. Uh, uh, no, because what happened? Let's see. That's 2009. That was after the. Because what happened there, people on the government support, there was ARA, the American Recovery and Something Act, and the, the spend debt, whatever it was. It was, it was an act to, uh, when the economy collapsed is just to spend a lot of money, right? And what they did is they, we got money in a number of different directions. Um, one of the sources of funding that we got is once we, 
you know, the overall idea for earthquake early warning had come out, it turns out that there was another very interesting direction that we could take. Um, uh, it turns out that FEMA was sending money, and I forget exactly the, the government acronym was, but they were sending money to these different uh, disaster districts. And that's not the right word. It, there's districts around the country centered on large metropolitan areas uh, where FEMA was sending lots of money. And they were sending money mostly to buy a lot of fire equipment. It also was the time when police departments probably got highly militarized and stuff like that by a lot of heavy duty funding from the federal government. And the city of Los Angeles actually had quite a bit of money in their pot and they couldn't really spend it anymore. And, um, but um, the mayor of Los Angeles had, and his team at this time got really convinced about earthquake early warning and they funneled a huge amount of money back to Caltech. Oh, wow. It was from FEMA to LA through a, one of these districts and then, but it somehow it got back to Caltech and we bought all these seismometers with this, right? And, um, and so simultaneously with this going on in the nineties, um, we decided that um, um, you know Ken Hargraves? Sure. Sure, maybe he's across the hallway from he you. He is, in fact. <laughs> maybe you have in, in the same office complex. But anyways, Ken had a predecessor, and his name was Hall Daly. Uh -huh. And he worked basically for the Caltech president as our chief person to interact with government relations, our government relations officer. Anyways, Hall worked very closely with the Seismo Lab, and he also works very closely with our lobbyist in Washington, D.C. So what we did is Caltech worked, and basically with the lobbyist and Hall, we set up this like group, Caltech and several of the other universities in the Western United States, but it was all organized by Caltech, is that we got everyone together to move forward on earthquake early warning. And it was a really, really strong effort to engage with our congressional members, our, the senators and our respective states. Um, and eventually through this kind of really um, honest lobbying on the part of the scientific community in a very collaborative way but again, organized by Caltech, we convinced the congressional delegations in these states to move forward on earthquake early warning. And, and, uh, and initially, you know, of course, the USGS was, there was even people in the USGS apparently weren't, weren't fully behind earthquake early warning. But eventually that happened, right? Eventually it got into the budget, um, the president's budget, and it was huge, right? And I forget what year all of this started in. Um, but with our earlier funding through this FEMA program, and then this funding, and then of course the state of California, uh, during the last, you know, even just five years ago, there was a whole state of California, um, a funding program for earthquake early warning called Q's Cal California early Earth earthquake early warning system is funding this quite substantially. But of course, Caltech was like way ahead of the curve in terms of seismometers. You look at maps in Western United States of where we needed to monitor um, so we could really do earthquake early warning in a very practical way. I mean, Southern California was like all the dots were on the map, right? Because we had convinced, I mean, it was just crazy. I mean, it was first after Northridge in 94, um, you know, this, the, you know, I wasn't in a leadership position at the time, but the Seismo Lab had convinced FEMA to support all these seismometers and they all went to Southern California. And then we kept building up. And then we, um, and then about this time in the, about the 2010 type period, we got this money that was funneled through FEMA, through these disaster areas. Um, and we've got more seismometers 
And then so and then at that point, earthquake early warning was going to hit the fan several years ago, right? And then, um, but then we brought in the state of California even in a bigger way, right? And so, I mean, we're still way ahead of the curve at this particular point. Um, yeah, and it was another interesting thing happened at that time, and I forget, you know, maybe that's closer to about 2000 when Yarun was director or not, I forget. But the scientific community had started off on this other thing called US Array and uh, was part of this program called Earthscope. And, uh, and they were gonna just cover the whole in this, the whole United States with seismometers and uh and it would be this moving thing the stations would sit there for 18 months and then they'd move and it was called bigfoot as it moved across the country but they started right here in our in our operating area right and so for the first year earthscope was like a year ahead of schedule according to their statistics and the the, the numbers that the national science foundation was quoting was earthscope was one year ahead of schedule right because what because caltech to all these other ways had gotten all this support from the federal government to put seismometers here and now they were redesignated so it was just an administrative thing to get this nsf program a year ahead of schedule um but in any event and eventually of course all those stations stayed put because they were ours <laughs> and then the rest of our scope just moved out from here but in any event yeah it was great so um um, what was the promise of earthquake early warning at that point? What kind of... It's always remained the same. I mean, uh, Tom Heaton, who really is the father of earthquake early warning in the United States, and he wrote this very famous paper in Science Magazine, even though the overall concept was not, um, um, you know, invented here, but or the implementation within the United States. It's Tom's idea. He was the, the driving force behind it. And basically the difference here of our earthquake early warning system to contrast with the Japanese is that we have our network here and the earthquake's gonna happen right here in the network, right? Whereas in the case of Japan, it's a li it's, it's, I won't say it's easier or harder, it's different in the sense that you have a remote earthquake and you're now detecting that it's coming towards you. I mean, whereas we're basically sitting on the time bomb and uh, it just goes off. And so part of it's gonna go off without any warning whatsoever. Um, so the promise of earthquake early warning has always been that we're gonna get some warning from earthquakes to help us mostly with the infrastructure and to give people some confidence that they can drop cover and hold um, uh, you know, either seconds or up to one minute before the intense shaking will actually happen. And to be honest with you, this is a very, we will have very devastating earthquakes here within um, the urban area of, of greater Los Angeles and Los Angeles County and surrounding counties. Um, and they're gonna happen right here and they're gonna be really devastating and they're not gonna be the big one. They're gonna feel like it, but they're not going to be it. But when the big one happens, right? Um, I mean, you know, we have a couple of big one scenarios and uh, it will happen in the Southern part of the, the Salton Sea potentially and, and rupture upwards um, and then go on the backside of the San Gabriel Mountains or it could potentially happen up near um, Tahone, I don't know if you, Fort Tahone, and then maybe it will migrate downwards. Um, and we'll get a good we'll get a good minute warning, especially if it happens out in the Salton Sea. For the large majority of the infrastructure within Southern California, and for the largest population centers, we're going to get a very good um, thing. And it's going to be extremely important, of course, for you know, the utility providers, um, in my own opinion. And it's worth, it's worth the money. It's yeah, that, not that, gigantic. Mike, that was my greatest. question. That was my question. If, you know, Los Angeles, the interest they had in investing in this really was a good investment from, from their perspective. Yeah, it is. Well, the politicians, it's definitely, I mean, it would be a gross, Riaragosa, the mayor of Los Angeles who took this on, which was the previous mayor of the city of Los Angeles. I mean, he, 
put it on and the current mayor actually is, is extremely um well i guess i don't know if he's left yet i guess he's still he's still there but the, and then also the governor is extremely supportive um of our efforts for the broader scientific community um but yeah no it's well worth it because again in the end it's not a gigantic investment compared to all the other investments we make in public safety and preparedness um but it's a good one because it's very well understood and the polit all the politicians now can claim credit and rightly so right they've all the main politicians um at least in southern california and then at the state level can really claim a lot of credit for what they've done they've they've thought this is going to be a big problem and it's going to hit the fan at one point we just don't know it's going to be right now in the next second maybe it's already happening but i know my computer would be looking at me if it's already started uh so i know it hasn't started yet but um uh you know it's a it's a good investment and uh, just the peace of mind i mean you know it's you know when this thing goes off for me and even though if it's a little bit of shaking there have been some cases where the house is shaking a little bit um and it gives you a little bit of peace of mind when the alarm goes off and you know it's coming you know and, and then and it does come and mike to clarify this investment from los angeles was it all about simply buying more seismometers or was there an opportunity to invest in basic research? And no, this has been the real, for amongst the Seismolab faculty, this has really been um, uh, a little bit, I'm not, it's not the word controversial, but, um, you know, they're not fully, they're not throwing fully themselves behind this, right? Because there's not much research that the Seismolab faculty can do, right? There are important un scientific unknowns, right? I mean, the biggest issue that we have in Southern California for earthquake early warning is when the earthquake can happen. Uh, when it first starts to unfold, let's say it's gonna happen um, in, um, you know, near Bombay Beach or something like that. It's going to happen in the southern part of the Salton Sea, um, near Browley or something like that. It's, um, you know, it's going to start off. It's going to start going, you know, and it's going to be a five and it's going to grow into a six and then it's going to grow into a seven. And, but we don't really know, right? Because the earthquake, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is the biggest interesting thing. And, and uh, the Caltech faculty have been on one side of the fence and there's a lot of people in the community we've taken along with us. And then there are these other people who I don't, I don't believe are, they're just naive. And we can't tell if an earthquake is gonna be big or not, right? We just can't tell. Because what happens an earthquake starts and it grows and at some point it stops little earthquakes right at the beginning look just like the big ones going to look exactly right they're just little earthquakes that are starting right and they just get bigger and bigger whereas at some point the earthquakes get slower so one of some people in earthquake physics it's not my area but what they say is it's not a matter of you know what starts it is what starts an earthquake, but like, why does an earthquake sort of stop? Why does it stop growing, right? That's one of the big questions in earthquake physics. You know, people at a very fundamental level of the physics of the process, like Nadia Lapusta works on. And this is what we just don't know, right? And so for earthquake early warning, one of the issues is we, we, we tend to initially underestimate things. Okay, if we have an earthquake right now, even a small one of, of, of five that starts in the Salton Sea. My computer will start buzzing like just like right now, okay? But it's gonna say three, right? And then it's gonna grow bigger. And it's just as time goes on, right? As the rupture starts propagating up the San Andreas Fault, it's just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And as time goes on, it's gonna get, you know, and at some point we can't, with our seismic instruments, initially we can't tell. So we tend to underestimate the size of the earthquake. 
And but by the time it unfolds with GPS, you can, right? But that may we we will start probably getting we under some scenarios we will already be ha be shaking here in Los Angeles, and the earthquake will still be getting the big one will still be growing, right? So it's a so it's a fundamental still a big fundamental unknown, just partly scientific, right? And it's a unknown having to do with the physics of earthquake and other parts it's sort of practical right and uh, i mean earthquakes don't get big until they're big i know that sounds like it's silly and but that's the truth and so um but there's some people they they thought there was like some magic they could see you know right at the first part of the p wave that they argued that um it was different right but then Hero was the greatest naysayer of this. I mean, it just showed the two seismograms and they'd look at what the displacement looks like as a function of time and just lay them right on top of each other. There's just zero difference, right? And so Hero was the biggest person who poo-pooed this whole idea that you could tell uh, it's some something special about that little one because there wasn't anything, right? It, it's kind of like a pipe dream. Most people in this, I think everyone in the seismic lab thinks that's the case. Um, but people keep pursuing it, right? They keep thinking that there's going to be something special that they're going to be able to see right at the beginning um, that's going to tell us, oh my gosh, it's the big one. Let the alarm go off right now in LA. It's a magnitude 8.3. And, you know, everything needs to be turned off. The water. The aqueduct needs to turn off. The electricity needs to turn off. The power company needs to redirect the power. Everyone needs to duck, cover, and hold. Um, you know, but then it comes in and it comes in as a five. So, Mike, um, let's turn back to your research. So once right. you figured out how to balance administrative responsibilities directing the Seismo Lab, what was the research you were focused on circa 2009, 2010? What were you involved with at that point? Well, the most important thing at that time I was involved in was this was this um, external collaboration that got freed up for me, and it was all the people I had met uh, through this CIG project, uh, and then we got, and it was basically the idea that we were because my contention has been that what makes plate tectonics plate tectonics and is that really that we have these extraordinary mechanical discontinuities in the system and if we were going to simulate mantle convection uh, and flow we really need to get these very fine scale features but we wanted to do it on a global scale and so since the 1970s late 70s, early 80s, individuals had been sort of simulating with mathematical tricks that they were mathematical trick, but they didn't get the physics right of how you could have global plate motions, but still viscous flow with faults. People still hadn't been able to do that. And it was remained a gigantic computational sort of challenge. Um, but I was working with this group of individuals and it was this mathematician. I, because of CIG, I, I stuck up, uh, started up, a, struck up a collaboration. Omar Gattas, he's a professor of computation at uh, UT Austin. And I convinced him that what we wanted to do was to see if we could simulate the Earth at a kilometer scale and uh, so people at the time weren't even doing little eeny beady models of this. Um, and so I brought the physics to them and, and Omar, I guess he had just moved to Texas. And he had, had these three postdocs and they were all brilliant in, in the computation and applied mathematician. And so the, those three postdocs, Omar and myself, we all worked closely together on this particular topic. And uh, and it required, and I actually can't claim credit for it, but I was motivating it, that they made a huge breakthrough in computer science. And it was to do a methodology, which had been around since the 1960s, called adaptive 
mesh refinement, AMR. So one of the great things about computational methods is that they can have a mesh. And if you have a lot of details, you can have a very fine mesh. But in adaptive mesh refinement, that, that A word is critical, it adapts. So the mesh itself adapts to the dynamics, right? And so the, again, this had been around since the 1960s. People had figured out, oh yeah, something cool happened. So take something that you're familiar with, I'm sure, is let's say you have, this would actually be hard to do, but I'll use it anyways. Uh, take something like turbulence. Let's imagine you have a turbulent eddy that went off. Oh boy, that's got all this fine detail, right? And so you want to like zoom in on that and have that as a fine mesh and let that mesh follow that thing. But then everything behind it is sort of like just laminar flow and you don't need the mesh. Okay, now people figured out that you could do this, but what it required on a parallel computer is that you needed to hold all this information in memory, this very complicated mesh. And, and so people could make AMR, but they could only scale it up to about a dozen processors, right? And uh, so that just wouldn't work. But then this group I was working with said, aha, uh -huh, what we can do is we can use a tree structure which is a logical way to represent data. It's very compact and it can be represented by this very simple data structure with a bunch of integers, but yet it can represent a spatially incredibly complicated domain. But then I wanted it to do it and that's called a tree, but we were gonna do the earth and the earth is a sphere is naturally periodic boundary conditions. So it comes back on itself. Oh, how do you do that? So they came up with this idea that you could have a forest. First of all, you could represent a mesh with this tree structure, and then you could have a forest of them and they could have a periodic body condition. And so they could talk to each other on no matter which direction you went in the forest with these different trees. And so this work, and we would take the equations I knew very well, and we've been solving for a number of years, the Stokes equation with this nonlinear, we're gonna solve it with AMR, and we would do the whole world at a kilometer scale. So I remember we popped, we, I was not, um, maybe I still was the director of the CIG, but we had a workshop on this and it was a small workshop of just people who were very, very good in this field. We brought all the people in geodynamics with all the people in applied math who, in computation who do this method. And I'll never forget our group, and there was outlined what, our, what we were gonna do. We were gonna do Stokes equation on a globe and we're gonna do it at a kilometer resolution. We were laughed out of the room. We were literally laughed out of the room, right? And they said, it's impossible what you're saying. You people are, you're fantasizing, right? Well, 12, 18 months later, in the front page of Science Magazine, I think it was, a, yeah, it was, it was the front cover of Science was our visualization and our article in there. And we basically showed we could solve the problem and we did it, we did it, we did it at a kilometer scale. So basically we put faults and we got all the physics of plate tectonics in that. And so we worked really, really hard on that. And um, so that was one thing I had done at that time. But then in parallel to this, right, I had, and um, so that was a huge breakthrough, right? And it was a breakthrough, not so much a collaboration, Caltech breakthrough at all, right? It was a breakthrough of a number of people working in the community. And, uh, but simultaneously with that, I was working with my students here. And um, what we were working on in parallel to this uh, as a, was uh, one of the themes that I had worked on earlier was to use the stratigraphic record and the, and the record from, 
from the continents of how continents went up and down as a constraint on what the stresses were and the forces on in the mantle, but it constrained it as a function of time and of long periods of geological time. So I was working with my students, two students, and we, and so this was done on the big parallel computers we were building, right? And this is why it was so important to have those parallel computers. We, we basically built an adjoint of the mantle convection problem. Now, I was not the first pe person to write a paper about this, right? And that is what we were going to do is we were going to take mantle convection. Now we're talking about the time dependent flow of convection in the mantle on in a sphere, right? And what we were going to do now is we were going to take it back in geological time. We would start with our present day images of the earth. And then what we would do is we would use plate tectonics because I was also working on this G plates project. And then I would take my stratigraphy and there would be the constraints as a function of time. We would take it now and try to solve the four dimensional problem backwards in time with an adjoint. And you have to use, this is a mathematical trick that we use that's widely used in weather forecasting, right? So when they, when we have this, this weather forecasting comes in for the storms, they use an adjoint model and they're continuously assimilating present day information in. And then what they do is they, they keep getting it right. And then they keep, and then they project it, they go, they're going, they're going backwards and forwards in this to try to get this thing right. Um, and, and we're going to take some of these same ideas now and use them in mantle convection. So I brought, you know, so my students had to, you know, develop all the adjoint equations for the, for the convection equation and then integrate it backwards in time. And then we also had an article in science magazine on this with my students. It was just a seismic lab thing. And, um, and, um, and so that was very important because it it was because uh, now it was an inverse model is what I had done. But we had done it actually, you know, sort of. So that's what we those were two of the things we were working on. So the big thing I did with Omar Gantas, we couldn't use it, our own computer here internally because it was, actually wasn't big enough. Remember, I, we, we couldn't work it big enough. And that work, we continued on with it over several years. And we eventually, several years later, we won the Gordon Bell Prize. Um, well, that's the top prize in computing. And, uh, and that's when we, we took our equations and we were able to run it on a million processors um, and which, uh, because the equations are called implicit equations, they're not explicit. Like, I think I had brought this up to you before on Yarun's equations, which are solved explicitly, and it's just natural to solve them on a parallel computer. When you do things implicitly, it's a nightmare to solve them on a parallel computer, but we worked with this group and we figured out a way we could get it on the largest computer that Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory had. It actually was behind the fence. <laughs> and uh, we went up and we all went up to 2 million processors and it was, and it was staggering. Uh, and we basically had linear scaling all the way up to this. And again, it was the same problem we were laughed out of the room on. We eventually showed that, that we could go without any bounds whatsoever if the computer was big enough. Um, so, I mean, I, I glossed over a whole bunch of things in there. Um, but again, it was computing was one of the major themes in all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it, because I met a lot of people in high performance computing um, through the CIG program. A lot of it was done in the Seisma lab with Caltech students. Um, and uh, the paper on the first adjoint ones was done by Li Jun Liu. He's now a professor at the University of Illinois. He's become very prominent in the field um, and has had a number of breakthroughs uh, since leaving here. So yeah, he's, he, he was very creative um, but yeah. What were some of the big debates with mantle convection at this point? Well, that's very interesting because at this point, 
most of the scientific community, it was one of the quotes, I think it was maybe one we didn't go with, um, that, that we had talked about before, the thing between, um, the thing between upper mantle and whole mantle. By this time, I would say this now, that's for most of us who really understood this problem, that's totally just solved. And basically what had happened at this point, it was, it was some hybrid mode of convection, right? We knew that the big slabs had gotten deep into the mantle. And that was actually kind of critical for us to reverse convection all the way back over the Cretaceous and solve a major sea level problem with that, with the adjoint models. But basically it was the slabs go down into the deeper mantle. But the big question that now started to emerge and we, and, um, was that besides the return of plate tectonics to the deep interior, we had these other gigantic structures in the mantle, not the downwellings, but the upwellings. And there were these very large regions in the lower mantle that, um, what time do we have to end? Uh, 3.30, so we're oh, good. 3.30, okay, because I have another appointment when this ends as well. So anyways, the these other structures in the in the lower mantle uh, back in um, in the day when we first discovered them, when the seismologists first discovered them, Adam Zaswanski, uh, Rob Clayton here at Caltech, um, we called them super plumes. Okay, and uh, well, Don Anderson didn't like plumes. Okay, so I, in tongue in cheek, I really took on to this this uh, way of calling them, so we call them super plumes. Uh, eventually the scientific community, the geophysics community did not like that word and moved on to unfortunate, uh, you know, names after that. They were just difficult to technically com complicated. But, um, but in any event, so we had these giant upwellings, right? And so now the big debate was, whoa, are these gigantic thermal upwell? They're two big debates, okay? that we participated in, one and the whole community participated in, is that are they thermochemical and on the one hand, and are they uh, are they sta sta stationary or are they um, or are they mobile? Okay. And so one of the interesting things that emerged is well these were had been known since um, since the 1980s. Uh, and then one of my former students, uh, Xi Zhong, Z-H-O-N-G, I'm not sure if you've spoken with him, very prominent in the field. He and his postdoc, they took the big code that we developed here at Caltech and he, no, he actually, he took Louis code and he made it spherical and, and they, and uh, this was all done when he was a postdoc and uh, called it sitcom S and we've used it to do a lot of things. But one of the things that Shiji did is he took it and with one of his postdocs is he is he could take the history of subduction and he could reproduce where these guys were located. Okay. He could basically get the large scale geography of the lower mantle. Okay. And uh, to me, it was just obvious, right? So I wasn't surprised at all by this, but it was an important breakthrough and we've, there's, we've worked on this quite extensively. Um, ever since. But what happened is imagine now we have thermal convection and of course cold material goes down and hot material goes up. But then you have all this very dense material, right? And that dense material, because it's dense, it's going to want to mostly sit down in the deep mantle and it would get moved around. It would be stationary, it would get moved around. And so it was sort of like opposite. In fact, most of the community doesn't recognize this. This first emerged in a calculation I did as a graduate student. The first time one could see this physics, that you could see these large thermochemical structure in the lower mantle, and they'd move around with plate tectonics. And they were kind of opposite to this idea that I had developed for continents, which is really a, the computation of the idea that Don Anderson had, is that you'd have these sort of rafts, these light rafts on the surface of the earth, and they'd move around with the con and go into supercontinents and then they'd break apart, but they'd stay up there, right? And they'd sort of 
that go, move over the cold areas and then that sit over the cold areas and then they're accumulating a supercontinent and break apart and then they move apart. And so we showed this in a, it, that's what I did as a postdoc here at Caltech. But we, the opposite of these things are these sort of thermochemical structures in the lower mantle. And um, so we worked a lot on those things. A number of students did lots of terrific work on these in terms of their stability and their mobility and uh, what they, what their, the nature of that material could be. Graduate right? students worked on that. And, uh, and so that was the big debate, are these big thermochemical structures which are mobile? And we were on the mobile side. In fact, most of the scientific community is on the mobilist side. Um, there's a group uh, in um, which by senior members of the geology community who think that they're sort of like stagnant and stationary. And, um, uh, but most of the, I don't think that they've convinced most of the geophysics community. So there's been kind of like a big debate between the geodynamics community, people like myself, uh, Xi Xi Zong at the University, at the University of Colorado has been, um, has done the most amount of work on this, that they're sort of mobile kind of like structures um, in the deep mantle. But yeah, I mean, that's uh, the stuff that we had worked on during this period of time from like the mid uh, I don't know, from the, I don't know if it would be the mid, uh, the mid to like 2010s type period into that decade right in there. Yeah. And, and where, we're still doing a little bit of work on that as well, but not a lot. And where, where is plate tectonics in all of this? Where does it fit into the research questions that you're asking on mantle convection? Well, it, it sort of comes in too. It's such a complicated problem that um, you know it's not fully sort of solved and you can write down all the equations and everything will sort of fall out. So because of that, I've sort of taken a more, try to take the problem apart. Um, I think last time I tried to discuss um, the, you know, the initiation of subduction and uh, trying to understand that problem because that's, there's not wide acceptance on on that problem because it doesn't follow directly from the kinematics of it doesn't follow directly from the 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 kinematic record that you can clearly read uh, with plate tectonics it it doesn't because it because subduction sort of eats its own geological record you can't directly infer the beginning of subduction directly from the plate tectonic record you can piece it all together partly by the plate tectonic record and then with the record of other observations. And uh, so I worked a lot myself with postdocs and then with graduate students, including a graduate student even up to today on the mechanics of this process um, because it's still sort of like the holy grail. But because our models had gotten ahead of the observations, I try, I don't know if I explained this to you before, I did go off on a secondary career in marine geophysics in terms of both ocean drilling as well as uh, regular uh, geophysics out at sea. So um, to try to collect the observations at key areas uh, in the ocean, in the Western Pacific in particular, to help us constrain the models. And, um, and uh, but yeah, I'm not sure if I'm really answering your questions, David, or not, because no, it's no, kind no. of comp That's one way. It's the sort of the mechanics of how it works. Yeah. But then if there's another whole issue, and it, it this is Don Anderson coined a term. He coined a term, bottom up, or top down. Convection, right? In the sense that was what we see at the Earth's surface was it the guiding principle and it just basically determined everything um what you see in the deep interior right so it's the physics of plate tectonics and how it works that would be top down right and then in bottom up you have a bunch of plumes and maybe in the mantle and they cause gigantic upwellings and this causes and influences the tempo of the earth I believe it's mostly, it's probably a balance between the two. And, um, and because it's such a complicated process, I don't believe it's fully 
solvable. Now, what we've learned, and perhaps Xi Ji Zong's work, my former graduate students, demonstrating that the large scale geography of the deep mantle can be predicted by plate tectonic models, evolutionary plate tectonic models, okay, that you can that you know you can sort of take this sort of top down approach, right? Uh, from an observational thing. And so we've done a lot of work. Other people in the community have done a lot of work on trying to use more and more sophisticated models of mantle convection with some of the physics, but not all of the physics of plate tectonics, plus the observed geological record of plate tectonics. Other thing I've worked very hard on synthesizing with collaborators, that we can use that approach to predict, quote unquote, the kind of things we see in the Earth's deep interior. Um, but no, you know, I think it's it's kind of a not fully solved problems. Don Anderson's sort of um, sort of catchphrase of of top down or bottom up. I, I don't, you know, I think people in the community like to take one direction or the other. But I I don't I don't um, think we can fully answer it at this point in time. Mike, last question for today as you know, high powered computing was becoming more and more recognized in geophysics. Where was the software playing catch up with the hardware and where was the hardware playing catch up with the software? Well, um, it's more, I mean, the hardware just keeps I mean, that's a very interesting question. I mean, the hardware just generally, in general, just gets better and you have to figure out um, better algorithms to take advantage of it, right? And generally, bigger speed ups have occurred because of software compared to hardware. But what happens is that new hardware triggers new software development, right? And so I think, I mean, I think Jeroen Trump's research with SpecFam and the spectral element method being applied was a great example of that. I think the collaborative work I was involved with was Omar Gattas was a great illustration of catching up uh, on the geodynamic side of things uh, with the hardware. But, um, you know, in general, it's sort of like, well, we, we get this, we have this hardware, right? And so now let's, can we sort of exploit it? And very interesting, like right now, the discussion which is going on, right? So this is not in the past, this is the future. The, you know, NSF, you know, it wants to, the largest machine that NSF is now supporting um, for scientific research is called Frontera. And um, so by the way, it's sort of like a, a takeoff on Vannevar Bush's thing, the endless frontier, yeah. right? And so they have, well, it's also Texan, so Frontera, you know. But in any event, so this is a big computer, and we're on it. We compete, we were, we competed in the in the competition to get on this particular computer. One of my students uses it. But right now, we're actually in a next phase of this, right? And this is the next phase of trying to think of what's going to be on Frontera. NSF is going to come up with sort of two different supercomputer centers. One will be the sort of the routine com supercomputer centers that they're currently funding, which we use a lot of. And then the other one is going to be a follow-on, and it's going to be more like a national center. And I guess it will be based in Austin. And NSF is now trying to figure out what the architecture of, of this computer is going to be. And so the National Science Foundation has selected 30 projects, which are called CSAs. Um, they're called, um, um, characteristic science applications. I believe that's it. We'll need to check on that, David. If, if my memory serves me correctly, what CSA means. There's been 30 selected in the United States and our project, we have one, it's a great earthquake project is one of them. 
And interestingly enough, uh, this is kind of interesting. There's four projects, I believe, in the earth science. One of them is for the atmosphere. Three of them are for seismic. <laughs> this is kind of interesting. Three out of 30, that's like 10%. And, um, but the other two are basically speed up of existing methodologies. They're truly, they're already characteristic science applications, right? We've actually proposed one where we have no idea what the heck we're doing. We're trying to, we're actually trying to make a quantum jump. And what we're trying to do, and this, uh, Nadia Lapusta is on the team. This is a national team. Uh, so the biggest group is at Caltech, I guess on the, the project leader, and um, and I it's great earthquakes and plate tectonics, and our idea is we're going to try to do the great earthquake cycle. At the same time, we do the motion of tectonic plates. So, where the science, where there's a huge effort, one of the big areas of of geodynamics right now, is trying to cross time scales be between the short time scale phenomena physics of earthquakes unfolding on the one hand and slow tectonic motions on the other. Essentially, in all cases, the way this is being looked at is, well, let's, in fact, Nadia had, had done a classical example of this for her research on the San Andreas Fault. Well, she just takes the San Andreas Fault. It moves at its, at its motion with the motion of the Pacific plate with respect to the North America plate, it's slow motion, she just takes it. And then, and she says that, well, in the far field, she knows that the two plates need to move at that rate. And now she unfolds based upon the physics of the earthquake process of how the earthquake unfolds. Now, and people are also doing this within a subduction zone. A number of very interesting papers have been written. What we're attempting to do what Nadi and I are attempting to do is we're trying to simultaneously predict, not impose plate tectonics, but have plate tectonic motions emerge from the earthquake model itself. Mm -hmm. So they actually would go back and forth. But this is such a transformative calculation beyond anything what we're trying to do. It would basically would be the same model we're trying to use instantaneous plate motions, that the code that won the Gordon Bell Prize. And now put the physics of both elasticity and viscous flow in there, also with the frictional physics of an earthquake. And uh, so it's, I mean, we're probably, ours, ours probably won't get selected because I mean, if we're competing against codes that already go against it, but we'll push our work because what we want to do is we want to do something truly transformative. Mm -hmm. We want to take earthquake science to the next step. And my own feeling is this is it for plate tech. This would be the next big thing. Can I get plate motions? Can I get the Pacific plate and any super cycles in the occurrence of earthquakes simultaneously with the earth, great earthquakes themselves, right? I can get that tempo, right? As opposed to assuming one or the other. In geodynamics, it's always been, oh, I put a fault in there, a fault exists, and now the plates just slowly creep creep along with the bo negative buoyancy which exists in the system, which we measure, which we can measure with, with various ways. On the one hand, or can I just say, well, plates go at five centimeters per year and they just move and then they drive the two plates and they grind past each other and then all the frictional behavior physics unfolds. I want to do the true coupling on a, glo on a global scale, right? I mean, people are going to probably take me to, uh, you know, to the mental hospital for trying to imagine that one can actually do this on a computer. But we've been laughed out of the room before, right? And I'm prepared to be laughed out of the room again. Um, and uh, I might be able to do this before I finish up. And I want to finish up being director quick so I can <laughs> more, spend more time in this problem with Nadia. And uh, and there, again, there's a small national team of investigators working on this. And uh, that's what I think the holy grail of geophysics is. Mike, that's a great point. We'll pick up next time. We'll see where things, things are headed. <laughs>